All right, I'm ready to start my next build. Yo, can you hand me an unbuilt kit out of the stash over there? Yeah, yeah, one of the older ones. No, not that one. Yeah, one of the really older ones. Did you go ahead and throw one on the table? Oh, hey. That'll do. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale German SDKFZ 234-4 armored car. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contact me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model that we have here is built extensively out of the box. There is literally no other modifications or add-ons that were made to it outside of what the kit offering supplies you with. In this video, we're going to be going over all of the kit's features. I'm going to be giving the model a thorough inbox review, and I'm also going to be highlighting several key features that the model has, as well as what to watch out for when working on one. So stay tuned because there's going to be a ton of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the German World War II SDKFZ 234-4 armored car. This particular version of the SDKFZ 234 was the last in a series of vehicles that were based on the same chassis. The vehicle itself dates back to the 1930s where the German military designed their first Achtenraden, or eight-wheeled armored car, and that vehicle was seen and used to great effect during the original opening months of World War II. The German High Command was so impressed with the vehicle's performance that they wanted further development of vehicles in a similar type of format. Of course, the lineage of vehicles that preceded this particular group of vehicles here would have been the SDKFZ 231, 232, and the 233. These vehicles were again very highly touted by the German High Command, however towards the usage in North Africa some shortcomings were noticed and they saw some areas where they could have been improved and these improvements were going to be utilized on the next generation of eight-wheeled German armored cars starting with the SDKFC 234 series. The first and probably the most largest change was with the way the vehicles were designed on their chassis. The predecessor vehicles utilized a box frame chassis and then the armored hull sections were simply attached upon it. The new 234 series was going to utilize a all-encompassing monocoque type chassis which gave much better armor protection and all of the important drivetrain and transmission components were now housed in a central armor channel that was built into the vehicle's hull. One of the rather interesting design features that were found on the German eight-wheeled armored cars that were first utilized on the predecessor vehicles but have then carried over into the 234 series was the use of a secondary driver. The idea was that if the vehicle needs to go into reverse, it can immediately shift into reverse and be driven in a controlled manner. This was possible because the vehicle utilized two drivers, one in the front and one in the rear. Keep in mind, this is several decades before the idea or the advent of backup cameras and LCD screens, which is a luxury item that is found on modern military vehicles. Back in the 40s, you know, you just utilize a second driver position for that type of performance. The secondary driver position was something that carried over into all of the 234 series, from the turreted version, which is the Puma, to both of the turretless variants like this version that we have here. Although I must say that the driver position in the rear is probably haphazard just due to the interior layout of the fighting compartment, the driver position does seem to get in the way. Regardless, it still had this capability as well all the way up till the end of its production and really its service life. Another interesting aspect of this vehicle's design was with the engine. Rather than going with a Maybach liquid-cooled V12 or V6 gasoline powered engine, all of the 234 armor cars were going to be powered by a single Tetra 103 air cooled diesel engine. This is actually one of the very few German vehicles of World War II that was powered entirely by a diesel power plant, and specifically one that was air cooled nonetheless. This particular version, the 234 4, was unique because it had an open top 
layout that contained a single pack 40 75 millimeter this was done to give the 75 some excellent mobility as this platform here was very good with operating on both on and off-road conditions Although with the vehicle in this format, it really did push the design limitations of the chassis to its full extent. Regardless, the vehicle was still able to mount the Pack 40 in place and was still able to do it in a relatively efficient manner. The 234 family entered into production in late 1944 and continued all the way up into the war's end in 1945. In total, 478 units were produced and this is with all of the vehicles in the 234 family, be it from the turreted version to the open top pack 40 variant like we have here. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale Dragon SDKFZ 234-4 armored car kit. As I alluded to earlier on in the video, this is a old stash inhabitant and has been sitting in the stash literally since 2009. And if I go ahead and just show just how much crap is on the cover of the box here, yeah, you could definitely see that this one, it's a bit overdue for me to start it, shall I say. This mall here was actually a gift and was given to me by my father back in 2009 while we were at the 2009 New Jersey Mosquito Con model contest. At the time, I was there with a few of my 1.6 scale models and I wasn't really doing a whole lot of 135th scale during this time period. So it was a bit of a surprise when my dad showed up with a bag with a few brand new dragon kits that he procured from one of the vendors. I was literally just sitting there looking at the models that were on display. Next thing I know, my dad shows up with a bag and he's like, hey John, check these out, I picked them up for you. I'm like, cool. <laughs> uh, they were really interesting. This one particular was also pretty cool because at the time I was working on a 1.6 scale 234-2 Puma build. So it was kind of cool that he picked up this model for me and at the time I was already kind of in a Puma mood. Although I was working on the 1.6 scale one, I wasn't again really actively building in 135, so the model was placed in the stash and it literally sat there for that entire duration of time up until, well, the filming of this video. So I think it's safe to say it's about time that I actually get around to this model and getting it built. At the time this model was given to me as a gift, I was actually particularly surprised by it because this was a brand new release from Dragon and at the time this kit was pretty hot stuff. This kit was originally released by Dragon in 2008 so obviously you know a year later this thing still had steam coming off of the plastic parts because they were still that fresh. This was a pretty interesting release from Dragon because there weren't really a whole lot of options out there for the Octonraden or I should say the Puma chassis pattern of vehicles. Prior to this, there were limited Oxenraden variants out there, one of which being the oldest would be from Tamiya. That was a very earlier version. And then the other more noteworthy one would have been the Puma from Italy. That kit, it's a decent kit. I've built a few, you know, in the years past, but you know, it, that is a product of its era. This kit here being made with at the time brand new technology tooling was something that was a nice asset to the hobby and this kit here does have some excellent detailing on it which you'll definitely see once I'd be able to crack the box open. Because this Dragon kit is a newer release kit they are fairly common to come across and shouldn't be too hard to track one of these down or at least last time I checked. These models here are the type of thing that you can find swirled away in a local hobby shop or more than likely you can easily track one of these down on a eBay type listing. So starting with the box art and the graphic design, here you can see the setting that's present with this release. Here we have the Athenraden armored car with the Pack 4075. The rendering on the vehicle is nicely done and everything is well composed in the scene. I'm not really sure who illustrated this scene. It doesn't really look like a Ronald Volstead piece, but generally I have seen this artist work on other Dragon kits of the contemporary period. The setting is pretty action-packed. It takes place during the winter season. We have a half-track with a short-barreled Pack 75 in the background, and we do have some burning, knocked-out Russian vehicles, namely a T-3485 over here, and what looks to be another T-3485 in the background. 
And also the setting of a bombed out Eastern European village also looks pretty good as well in the composition. The remainder of the graphic design is quite typical for Dragon. We have here the name of the vehicle. This kit here, of course, is part of the 35, 39 to 45 series, which is one of Dragon's largest ever growing catalog items. Here we have the Dragon logo, along with some basic verbiage about how glues are not included and all that stuff. From the main box art takes to the side tab, and this is quite typical for Dragon kits from the 1990s time frame and all the way up through today, where we have a thumbnail of the box art in question, along with all the relevant information right here in a green box, along with the 35 to 49 labeling. This is kit number 6221, in case anyone is interested. And of course, it would be a mirror image on the opposite side. Over here, we have some CAD thumbnails of the kit in question. Note that this is a very highly detailed kit with both interior and exterior detailing, which is probably one of the reasons why I pushed this build as far as I have for starting it because interior builds usually slow me down, but it's, you know, high time I start this one. Uh, this kit is a multimedia kit where you have a mixture of both parts made in injection molded polystyrene, as well as components made in various types of metals, which you will see once I crack the box open. On the reverse side, you can see some more features that are supplied with the kit. We have two options over here for paint configurations. And also you can see some more of the features, namely a fret of photo etch, and several examples of the markings that are supplied with this kit. Here we have some corporate information. And by the way, as a quick update, I was wrong what I stated before when I said the kit came out in 2008. It actually came back a couple years before that, being from the 2006 period. Regardless, at the time my father gifted me this kit, it was still really, really new. On the rear portion of the box, this was during the time when Dragon started to put some more ad space on the rear panel, showing you some more features that the kit is supplied with. And this is something that Dragon has been doing now for a number of years. And as you can see, there are a lot of features that are supplied with this model, and you can render this build in a multitude of configurations just due to all the different variations of parts that are supplied with this one kit. Okay, so cracking open the box to reveal the contents takes us to the inner sections. The plastic used on this kit here is the modern era of Dragon Grey plastic. It's hard to explain exactly how that's different from the older generation kits. It's one of those things where if you've ever seen an older kit and compare the materials, you'll see what I'm talking about. The newer ones have just a different feel to them, and I believe this material here just lends itself for better, crisper fidelity of detail components compared to the older tooling, which were found on the kits that came out in the generations prior to this one here. So starting with the first runner takes us to the upper hull. And here you can see the detailing that is integrally molded into the moldings. Note the fender areas have the fasteners that are found in this section over here because on the real vehicle these would be two separate steel stampings that are secured together and there's a seam line that would be present. And we also have the later pattern of storage system where we just have two lockers as opposed to the earlier variants that had more storage found in this section over here. Also on the front, you can see how the hatch here is in the open position. And we also have some puzzle fit lines, much along the lines of the real vehicle. And I guess these are gonna help index the upper and lower hulls when it comes time for final assembly. On the interior section, we still have some extra details integrally molded into this section over here, but there's nothing here in the engine compartment. I believe that this model here is just fighting compartment only, and there is no engine compartment detailing, but I guess we're gonna see how much of that is the case as I dig into the remainder of the parts. And on that note, this model here contains a ton of runners. So this is one of those kits that may seem simplistic from the vehicle type, but Dragon really, really gives you a ton of runners. Now, I'm not sure how many of these parts are actually gonna be used and how many of them are gonna be relegated to the spare parts bin. This is a common trait that Dragon does implement, but we'll all see how this goes together. Uh, this runner right here is for the Pack 40. This is the armored shield, and it's in a two-piece assembly to give you that cool standoff effect that will be present on the shield on this type of unit. The part is very nicely detailed with the period fasteners 
that are conical in shape that are found on the outer section, which is an iconic bit of detailing for this bit of equipment. And on the inner shield here, we do have some other interior components. I'm not sure if this is lifted from their Pack 40 kit, but I have a good hunch it is since it does say Pack 40 right here on the sprue. These two mirrored, or I should say, duplicated runners over here are for the various suspension parts and if anyone has ever built or knows the thing about the Puma it is basically just rinse wash and repeat for the suspension parts so there's a lot of components that are in clusters and basically you have to rinse wash and repeat on all eight sets and the kit here does replicate that quite a bit and from what I can tell from the parts here it looks to be a good quality piece it's definitely more advanced compared to the older Italeri kit that I mentioned earlier Continuing with the suspension, here we have the wheels. And this being an armored car, you're not gonna hear me complain about how the tank has individual Lincoln Link tracks, because obviously it's a wheeled vehicle. But I will still take the opportunity to say that those tracks are crap and they are cancer on the armor modeling community. So there, I got my little jab in for that. But back to the tires in question, they are a multi-piece assembly and looked at some excellent detail quality found on the threads on all of the tire sections. The hubs are also present as well as the rims and the rims too look to be a multi-part assembly which will leave for some very nice detail fidelity. The next runner takes us to what I presume is the interior equipment sections where we have floorboards, a bunch of braces for the Pack 40 and the ammunition racks. Note we have an option here to render this with the racks in the open or in the loaded state. We have the gun cleaning staves, as well as a few other bits of odds and ends. Now I'm pretty sure all these will come to play during the actual construction. And on that note, we have some more interior components here. No, these aren't interior components. These are the components for the actual Pack 40. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Dragon released this as the Toad version on a number of releases earlier. So this kit here is really an amalgamation of both of those kits in order to create this vehicle, which, you know, is something that's commonly done in the modeling racket, and it's one that always yields for some pretty good results. Now we have three patterns of muzzle brakes over here, so decisions, decisions, decisions. The carriage, the breech, the main barrel assembly is a single molding, with the exception of the rear section over here, which is a independent piece. Now, I saw from the box side that there's an option to have this with an aluminum tube, but we'll see once I get towards the bottom. Regardless, like everything on this model, all the details are nice and crisply rendered in place. Digging on deeper takes us to more Puma parts, for lack of a better term. We have here the grills for the engine, the fighting compartment bulkheads, and a few other components that are undoubtedly really important for this build. The bumper included. And again, everything is molded in the same quality which is seen on the other components that I've already touched upon so far in this video. Going down deeper takes us to some accessories. These are the boxes for the Pack 40 ammo. We have some shells, some empties, and also some storage containers. It's a nice touch that that was included. We have here a set of other German armor car accessories, such as the fender indicators, Pioneer tools, fire extinguishers. And on this little fret here, we have some of the special stuff that is supplied with this kit. Okay, so starting with this, we have here a runner that's just for the jack and the headlights. This appears to be a generic German parts runner that Dragon seems to throw in on a lot of their other kits for a reason that should be obvious. And here we have some of the special items specifically for this kit. Like I touched upon before, here we have a beautiful CNC aluminum Pack 40 barrel. We have a fret of photo etch with the various components that are needed for this build. And we also have a fret of clear plastic components for things like the interior periscope visors. This is similar to what I encountered on the 38T build that I completed a little while ago. And just like in that build, these pieces do polish up very nicely and give the model a nice little detail edge. Also on the note of turned metal components, we have here a 
bunch of small CNC brass fender indicators. And this is a very, very nice little bit of detailing. For instance, something like this, normally the builder would have to acquire parts of this quality as an aftermarket accessory. But with this particular kit here, Dragon took care of you and it's something that comes standard with the model. Which is funny because the plastic ones that are supplied on this sprue here are also equally nicely, is nicely done. I mean, these parts here you could use and the build will turn out just fine. But if you're really that much of a stickler, you can swap those out for the brass ones, which I'm definitely going to be doing on this build. have no illusions of that. But regardless, this kit does offer a lot of very nice features. And of course, on the same section here, we have the water slide decals. They're standard blue paper water slides. And dragon markings, I've had some very good success with in the past. And generally, their decal quality is always very good. So we'll see how these pan out once everything is completed and varnished to the model. And the last section that's found in the box here are the two lower hull sections. Here we have the main trough, which is found on the bottom portion of the vehicle. And I gotta say, it is very, very, very nicely detailed. I mean, this was actually one of the features that they were pointing out on the section on the box. But here you get to see what it looks like in the flesh. And yeah, this piece is very, very nicely detailed. If anyone's ever built the Italeri Puma, this here is definitely a leg up. I'm pretty sure Dragon has also released several other variants of the Akhenaten, and I wouldn't be surprised, these pieces here are just rinse, wash, and repeat from that. So, if you're looking at one of those other Dragon hat armor car models, I'm pretty sure these parts would be included in it, and if they were, the quality is definitely going to be very good. On this bottom section over here, it is also just excellent with the detail fidelity. I mean, we have all the little subtle details on here where we have the seam cut line where the hull sections are two pieces that are actually bolted together with the flange work and we even have the other flange work which is found on the lower and upper hull section over here for the engine compartment and these would then be bolted together in that format and then bolted to the front section so the fact that I'm able to just discern that from this portion here just knowing the Puma and the, and the other German armored cars it shows you just how well detailed this section actually is and oop, Pardon. Anyway, uh, back to the interior part before it flung out of my hand. Fortunately, this is a big piece to go to Lost Party up. Uh, you can see the interior detailing rendered on these sections as well. And again, the entire model overall is a excellently detailed piece. The only thing absent from what I can tell from looking at all these runners is just the engine for the actual engine compartment. Outside of that, the model is very thorough. And on the very bottom of the box here, showing just how old this model is, we have here a nice little flyer to join them at the Dragon Expo of 2006. And there are some $5 coupons, so I'm pretty sure those are long since expired. But hey, you know, it's, the, uh, it's a nice little gesture. And here we have the instructions. And uh, wow, that's actually pretty surprising. There's not really a whole lot of areas marked out in blue, which is kind of funny. Generally, when you look at these Dragon releases, sometimes they mirror those redacted government documents you always see on the news where, you know, basically the whole thing is blacked out for without a, without a sentence. Uh, so yeah, that's actually really nice. But then this also shows just how thorough this kit is where all of these parts that are found here are going to be used on one build. So yeah, this is going to be an in-depth one. And yeah, I'd say that's pretty in-depth. Uh, yeah, I can tell you right off the bat, this is the type of model that you are going to have to pay very meticulous attention to the instructions because you can not only get easily lost, but you can also easily forget to put something where it needs to be or accidentally remove it off the runner because, yeah, yeah, you're going to have to pay attention to this one. Now, in the past, I've had some good results with these instructions where I haven't really found any mistakes here or there. Rarely this is the case where something gets noticed, but of course if it does, I'll gladly mention it during the latter portion of the video. But so far, this is uh, definitely turning out to be a very, very in-depth build, so looking forward to that. And what's this here? Oh, just some more 
documentation and showmanship on just the cool features that are supplied with this model. And here's the model going through its assembly. As I often do in these videos, whenever a model has an interior detailing type feature, I generally like to film the model at this point here just before the model gets sealed up. Because obviously, once the model progresses past this point, you really don't get to really see all of the interior detailing outside of what you can get visible glimpses of from the outside in. So let's go ahead and take the opportunity to bring the camera in closer to see exactly what this model gives you because it's actually extremely well detailed and it would be a shame to just skip past all this once it's fully completed. So starting with the bulk of the interior, we have it right here on the lower section. The interior is very nicely detailed and rendered, which means there are lots of little components that need to be assembled, and many of which are sub-assemblies, much along the lines of the suspension, which I'll be going over as the video goes on. These type of features on the inside need to be handled with care, during the assembly process and then you also as the builder need to pay attention to seam removal on several of these components. With the way the components go together very little if any hand fitting is required on the builder's behalf in order to get the parts to fit together appropriately and then most importantly to fit inside of their corresponding locations on the model. This is something that was a little bit different compared to some of the other Dragon 135th scale full interior models that I've done in the past, namely on the 38T. On that model, it was extremely nicely detailed on the inside. However, some of the mounting points were more or less suggestions as opposed to being a ironclad location where the piece of equipment needs to be fitted. On the armored car over here, so far that just hasn't been the case. Although I will say that getting the top section to fit onto the lower with these two supports over here is something that requires a little bit of finesse. I didn't have to hand fit anything at this time. I was able to dry fit the parts on a number of occasions. However, it is something that does require a little bit of attention to be given by the builder. If you take your time with the assembly and you just do the right Rubik's Cube type effect on knowing exactly how the piece lines up, you should be able to get the upper and lower on without any issues. The one little bit of hand fitting that I did do, is, which is not necessarily something that is a must or a requirement, is with the two feet that we have on either side. The two feet have a peg that descend from them, and then there's a corresponding location molded into the floorboard. Well, on this model over here, I went ahead and filed off those pegs with a needle file so it's a nice flat surface so it went into these locations without the need for there to be a plug assembly. I did this in order for the piece to fit on in a little bit of a well more streamlined manner as opposed to fiddling around with widening a hole and messing around with that. I just simply amputated the pegs fully and the piece was able to seat in place. With the way the floorboard is designed there are these two pegs found on the center portion over here and this large ammo locker just locks directly into place and everything really fits in so nicely that the two extra pegs on the floor weren't really that necessary. Of course a drop of glue was utilized on those in order to fully cement everything where it needed to be. One other thing I want to mention about the interior component layout is with its sequence of installation. You have to basically build this much along the lines of well like skins on an onion where you can't just fit parts on willy-nilly and then complete the installation. Everything kind of needs to be installed on in various layers and to do this this is something that you're really going to have to just feel for it yourself and this is why again all of these components were painted and weathered off the model. When I was building the model basically every single component that you see here such as the locker, the secondary locker, the seats, the steering columns, all of those little bits, well not so much the steering columns, but definitely the firewall over here, were all painted and weathered off the model, and then once everything was uniformed, I then went ahead and went through the motions of installing all of the bits. Some of the components that I did install prior to the model getting painted with its base coat are things like the controls, like the steering column, the pedals that you see right there in the front, the stick shift, the rear driving pedals, the rear uh, steering column and some of the controls. Not all of them because with the way the interior gets flushed out, you are it's in my opinion best left done after some of the other components are fitted. Again, this is just my personal take on it, but I'm pretty sure if you were building one of these, you may come across a similar situation like I did. 
On the firewall itself, this does require you to drill a hole or two on the inside. This is very clearly labeled in the instructions, and the hole is clearly marked here on the plastic plate, so there's no real guesswork. Just one thing I want to mention is that there is a sediment filter in this location right over here. It is molded in opaque plastic, but as I often mention in these videos, what I like to do is with a sheen of clear coat, I paint the jar section, which gives it a nice reflective look to it, and it kind of makes it look like it's glass-like in nature. And the top portion I paint with a little drop of silver aluminum paint, because from what I've seen on several real examples of these sediment filters, that's generally the material that they are made in. By doing this, it also gives a little bit of extra coloring to this section over here, and with this area being pretty visible once the model is going to be fully completed, it's a way to give just a little bit extra color. Some other components that are worthy to mention are the gas mask containers, which are on these two portions here. These are the kit supply ones and are nicely detailed out of the box. However, these are sections that are again are painted off the model. I paint them with the coat of Panzer Gray that you see on them. And also, of course, don't forget to paint the tool posts, or I should say the mounting brackets, which would be attached to the, to the vehicle. They are painted with the same Dunkel Gel that I use for the remainder of the interior layout, so it all blended together once everything got its coat of washing and other tricks that I use for the, for the interior weathering. The seats are, again, the kit original, nicely detailed out of the box. The little spring sections on the back are visible, and they are a little tricky to paint, but I was able to paint them carefully without getting any bleeding going on from the little thinly molded wires to the rest of the backboard, which was something that worked out pretty well. The other thing to mention about the German AFV seats is that they are, their pads, I should say, are strapped on with leather belts, and you can see that detailing present right there on these examples. All the details aren't integrally molded on, you just have to carefully paint them with a paintbrush and the piece is good to go. On a similar note, you could also see the weathering done to the seat pads themselves. This is just my typical technique with a little flat white that's diluted with water in the airbrush, a little toot toot in a couple locations, and you'll get the look that you see here. Some other interesting interior details to mention is the radio. The radio that's supplied with the model is very nicely detailed, and in order to really make it shine, I went ahead and painted it in the following format. First, the German radios are held in a gray plastic or some kind of a gray box type structure, which you can see right here. I went ahead and painted with the, the uh, Panzer Gray. The face on the radios are generally black, and so I just left it with the flat black spray paint primer that I used to paint the piece before the Panzer Gray went on. The little knobs and gauges were all painted with flat white and gloss black. And then once the flat white dried, a little drop of gloss lacquer or two were added to the various locations, giving you the look that you see here. The frame is something else that a lot of people tend to ignore or forget on these radios, but on these German radios, they're held into the vehicle via a frame type setup. The frame is integrally molded into this piece, and just with some careful painting by the builder, you can achieve the look that you see here, which is again a nice way to improve the accuracy and just the overall realism of the build. From the radio takes us to the spare periscope prism, that's right there on the storage bin that's present on the hull. One thing I want to mention about the storage bin is that when I first built the model, I didn't realize that this is actually open and is totally visible. So I actually had to repaint the inside with the yellow and then weather it like the way you see it here once the outside was already completed. Fortunately, this was easily done because the inside was already spray painted with flat black as a primer. So I just went uh, with some paintbrush Dunkel Gelb, painted the base color. Once it dried, I just continued with the remainder of the weathering, and it blended very well. For the prism itself, this is something that's really cool because you're going to see this on the upper sections, but on the prism runner, it's all molded out of clear plastic, which is excellent, and it gives some very nice realistic detailing. However, as the builder, you have to really stay on the ball with how you paint the parts. The prism box themselves, I painted in Panzer Gray, as I've seen this on many real examples. The prism lens itself is clear, although it's probably a little tricky to see on camera right now. But there's one other thing to mention, that's the little bracket that we have right there, comes around the side, runs along the face, and loops around again. That bracket would be attached to the vehicle, so obviously painting that would have to be the color of the interior. In this case, it's Dunkel Gelb. The, once the paintwork is all done, the piece simply glued in place, and at least for some very realistic results. Overall, I really like that Dragon went with this material for these pieces. Some other things to mention are the steering wheels. They are a glossy black plastic material on the real example, so I went ahead and mimicked them on this model over here. The last thing I want to mention is with the 
ammunition magazine right here on the side. You have two options to render, actually three options to render this. You could render it with the door closed. You could render it with it open. And once open, you have the option to have it with the shells in the loaded format, or you have it where it's totally empty. All of these are available and are up at the discretion of the builder. All the components go together very, very well, but I will warn that if you are modeling it in the open position that you see here, the hinge details are a bit frail and it's something that's very susceptible of getting damaged. Fortunately, I didn't run into too many problems with this piece and once the piece is installed, it actually holds it in place very well. Obviously for my rendition, I went ahead and rendered it with the locker in the open position with the magazine here fully loaded. This is one of the trickier ways to render this build. If you do not have the technique to painting something with this much precision, it's probably best either model it in the closed state or you can roll with it in the empty condition. Either which will definitely obviously do the job. If you are going to go with the loaded route, this does require a little bit more skill because you have to carefully paint each and every one of those shells and not get any paint bleed. And this is something that's purely dependent on the consistency of the paint. These metallic type paints can easily run to an issue where it might be too thin, where as soon as it, it's on the brush, and if it goes off the brush, it'll just run all over the place, and if that's the case, you're basically screwed, and you have to repaint the whole thing. On this section over here, I was lucky, and I was very careful with my paint application, leaving for the results that you see. Obviously, this is something that must be done off of the model. If you think you could just build all the interior and paint all these, yeah, you're you're definitely running on a fool's errand over there because it's not going to work out too well for you. I could speak from personal experience on that one. And uh, that's basically all there is. I am definitely going to go more into the fighting compartment over here because it's just laughable with the design of this vehicle. It's definitely something that wasn't really well thought out, but we'll see how that works out once everything is fully assembled. And that's really all there is to the fighting compartment interior. And let's go and look at the top section, which also has some excellent detailing on it. So here you can see what the inside looks like. Right now it does not have the remaining armor sections found on the top. These are going to be affixed once the upper and lower hulls are fully assembled. They are painted and weathered at this time, specifically on the interior sections. But you'll see more of this as the video continues. So here's the bulk of the work which is found right over here. Obviously you have that front hatch which is the entry hatch and it does have some nice detailing on it. I believe you have the option to render it either in the open or closed state. It is a non-functional hatch and on this model here I'm rolling with it in the closed condition. Here we have probably one of the cooler aspects of the build, which is the instrument panel. This is a very nicely detailed piece with just the way it's molded, but also Dragon went ahead and continued with the with the high quality by giving you the gauges as water slide decals. And this is something that is not for the faint of heart. If you don't have the type of building skills, this is definitely something that's going to give you a problem. The decals are excellently rendered on the water slide decal sheet and apply on very simply. However, the size of the decals are something that needs to be mentioned because they are so tiny and it's obviously unavoidable with something like this. I mean, look, here goes my index finger. And you can see how tiny these little gauges are. With the way they are printed on the paper, also leaves for a little bit of room for improvement because the, the decal sheet is so condensed that there is hardly any space on the paper in order just to cut the things out with a scissor. Fortunately, I was able to make do, but it is definitely something that may give someone who is not used to working with something this small and miniature a bit of a problem. The decals went on without any issues, but even with the way the pieces rendered, you have the gauge details that are molded into the plastic. So the gauges aren't just a small little bathtub and have lots of little rib, uh, ridges in them. And this can add a little bit of difficulty with the application of the marking, get it to slide into the proper space. And it also may add a little problem when you're dabbing it clean, you know, removing the water. It may stick to the rag as opposed to the part. Fortunately, I wasn't able to have any issues with any of those. The decals went on without any problem. Again, I've, you know, I was being really careful with it, and I have a lot of experience with this, so I was able to make do. In order to firmly secure the markings in place, unlike what I do when the vehicle is complete and I coat it with the matte varnish, for this one here, I just took some of the Tamiya clear coat, and I, with a paintbrush, I just added a drop to each every gauge. This has the effect of sealing it to the surface, but it also replicates the glass nature found on these gauges, which improves the accuracy overall. Hopefully the sheen 
will come out on camera. And this is was done to all of the gauges and also some of the knobs found on the piece, which would be plastic on the actual unit. On the instrument panel itself, you'll notice that I went ahead and painted it with the Panzer Grey as opposed to the Dunkel Gelb, just to give the inside a little bit more color, but you can also paint it with the same Dunkel Gelb color and be perfectly fine. On a similar note, this takes us to the prisms, and this was a very impressive bit of detailing found on this kit. Dragon could have phoned this in and just had these pieces just as a static piece where it's one unit, drops in place, and it's good to go. But that's not what they did. They actually did this on hard mode. So the pieces that you see here are actually functional. They can hinge open as they do on the real one and also as I've done on the 1-6 scale one. Which I gotta say in 1-6 scale it was a little tricky to do let alone in 135. So I really gotta commend Dragon for the engineering work that went into this piece here. The piece is a multi-part assembly where it's about two or three components, each of which are smaller than the than the next. And also, I gotta give props that the prism section is a fully clear plastic part, just like the spare prism that I mentioned earlier. Of course, rendering these parts in clear plastic really lends for some very accurate results. As you can see here, you just can't really fake clear materials, and with the Dragon Kit having these parts molded in that material, it's definitely something that shows the level of quality that are found on these kits. On the front area over here, it's actually a double pane where there's a prism, and then there's a, another piece of panzer glass found right here in the front to protect the driver when the visor is in the open state. The visors are fully functional, however, I've yet to test them on this build, and from what I've seen, the parts are theoretically possible to make them function, you know, frequently. However, from my experience, because the parts are so finely molded, this tends to leave it for, it's not really the best in terms of durability. If you can model this piece and have it function, all the power to you, but I'm just saying don't feel disappointed if you go through the whole build and you'll find out that the parts don't really function all that well. It's just with the nature of the beast, with the size of these components over here, it just lends itself for fragility. The one thing to mention is that the frame here is standard injection molded plastic, it's a separate molded part, and is a single piece unit which does cut down a lot on the complexity. However, the prism area and the hinge sections that connect to the outer visor plate over here are molded in clear plastic. On the model over here, what I did was I, of course, like to prime my components before painting them with the base coat. Just makes the paint stick better, of course. Only on this one, instead of using spray paint, I carefully applied the paint via a paintbrush and I just used Timia Flat Black. It does the exact same job as the spray paint does for the remainder of the model, only obviously it can be applied in much more a precise manner. Once the black dried, I went ahead and painted the various locations, either Panzer Grey for the frames on the prism, and I also painted the hinge work and the other components which would be part of the vehicle with the Dunkel Gelb. Once everything was weathered to this condition, it was then secured in place. And since I might as well try to display at this time, I believe the glues are dry, and let's see if I can actually get the prism here to operate. So let me find something small and pointy to give this a shot. All right, so I have my needle file over here. Let's see if I was able to get it to work. Okay, it popped open. And there you go, you can see it functional on the opposite side. Again, very, very, very impressive engineering and detailing on the part of Dragon. And this is true for all three of them, although I'm probably not going to be messing with these all that much, but you can see that if I wanted to, I can have the parts get be functional. See if I lightning could strike twice. That nah, one's a bit stiff. I guess if I fiddle with it a little bit, I could probably get it to work. But you know what? Nah, I'm I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm not going to push my luck. I'm happy with one of the units being functional. With the one in the front with the Panzer glass in the way, it's obviously a little bit more difficult. But if someone out there wants to finagle these and you know play with them further, more of the power to you. Before I depart from the front area, I just want to mention the little headrest, which is right over there. That's something that someone can easily overlook or not realize that's a headrest and just paint it with the yellow. Obviously, it would be a leather or canvas type material, so just paint it accordingly. On a similar note, here we have the crew MP40 stowed right there on the side of the wall. On this model here, I went ahead and rendered it as I typically do on my German models, where the model's rendered with the red Bakelite 
type furniture, which is something that wouldn't be uncommon for an MP38 or an MP40. It's just another way to add a little bit more spice to your build, as I often mention, or you can go ahead and paint those sections with a gloss black because the bake light was in either color. Whatever you do, don't just paint the whole thing flat black and, you know, weather it to look like worn steel. That's something that's definitely a mistake. The last thing I want to mention before I seal up the upper and lower sections is that at this time here you want to go ahead and install the grill work in these sections because these get installed from the underside and once the vehicle is together you're not going to be able to get them fitted in place. Well I guess you probably could through the rear section over here but obviously something that's less than ideal and you just don't want to go through with that. The kit does give you an option if you want to render with the louvers and the closer open state. Obviously I'm rolling within the open state because it just well looks so much nicer in that condition which of course you're gonna see how that looks once the model is fully completed. The next thing I wanna mention at this time is the work on the Pack 40. The Pack 40 is just as well detailed as the remainder of the interior, and I might as well just go over it at this time. Right now it's obviously going through its motions, but soon this here will be ready for its preliminary coat of flat black, and then the coat of Dunkelgelb, because Obviously, once this unit is together, you're not really going to be able to get paint in all of the locations. So, when I do models like this, I tend to build them up to a partially assembled form, to which then I can go ahead and add the, the paints that I just touched upon. So, starting with the main barrel assembly, you can see the aluminum turn CNC unit was utilized because literally it's the best way to go. The only thing to watch out for is that the aluminum is so nicely machined with its surface texture that glues will sometimes have a hard time sticking to it. So this is something that you want to pay attention to. You can burnish some of the areas down where the plastic parts are going to make contact with a piece of fine sandpaper. This is a technique to give a little bit extra texture and that will help the super glues bond with the part. Admittedly though, I didn't do that to this piece. It will still hold it in place, but it is a bit frailer compared to the other method, admittedly. On the breech section, this is a multi-component piece and this is best done again in layers. So you do the assembly of two or three pieces to get the overall block shape. Then you let the glue set, add the seam removal media, either red putty or in this case, I just use super glue polish down the seams, and once completed, then you can continue with the remainder of the assembly work, and finally assembling it to the aluminum section. The parts are, again, very nicely engineered. They go together very, very well, and it just shows you just how detailed the component is. The breech block itself is a separately molded component, as it is on most of these type of systems, and this, too, is a multi-component part that does need some seam removal work as well. You'll notice I did not glue the unit on at this time. This is something that I generally don't do. I always like to just have the pieces on in, as a friction fit because this allows you to have the model display with the breech either in the open or closed state. If you glue it in place, obviously, this basically just kneecaps you. And something like this just tends to work so well with the layers of paint built up on it that the need to glue it closed or open isn't really necessary in my opinion but you will definitely see more of that towards the end of the video. Right now, the brake itself is going through its, its uh, seam removal work. I went ahead and glued everything together, and I just have the glue set in the seam areas, which soon this will head off into polishing with just some sandpaper. What's cool is that you have three options of brakes to choose from, and it's just basically pick the one that you enjoy the most. For this one here, I'm going with this version because I already have a few Pack 40 equipped vehicles in my collection. They generally have the standard Pack 40 muzzle brake. So for this one here, I just wanted to differ it up a bit. The one thing on the section here that is very vague in the instructions is with this tiny little bit of equipment right there. This little piece has two plastic rods that come out of it and it needs to go somewhere here in the rear portion of the breech. Unfortunately, there are absolutely no indication marks whatsoever on where this component goes, and in the instructions, there is no real guide that tells you exactly where to put it. It's kind of drawn in an angle with an arrow, so that doesn't necessarily give you an ironclad place to put this item. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to do a little bit of research to see what it looks like on the real unit, and plus do a little bit of trial and error to see exactly where it fits once everything is fitted in place. But this is something that you're going to see as the video goes on, but this is definitely one of the weaker or more vaguer aspects of this kit that I did want to mention at this time. The rods themselves are two little thin, frail pieces of plastic. 
not uncommon, but in my opinion, it, if they break or are unable to be deburred properly, it's probably best just to replace them with pieces of metal wire. But again, we'll see if I'm able to go through with that. And But again, it's one of those things that's going to 50-50 chance. If, if it breaks on you, cool. If it doesn't break on you, even better. Regardless, it's something that's really easily taken care of. On this section here, at this point you can see that it is fully assembled. And again, this is something that needs to be done in layers. First, the two sides are assembled which also need the inner bulkheads put in place. And by the way, this little guide here is where those two plastic rods are going to slide in place. It's going to be weird to see how that actually works once everything is painted. But after that, you have a seam line to contend with. Once the seam is thoroughly polished away, that is when you could go ahead and install the remainder of the goodies found on this section over here. Everything goes together very, very well, and it's, again, very nicely thought out. On this front section, you have a couple options to render it. You can either render it closed with one of two options of triangular end plates over here, or you can render it with it in the hinged position. For this one here, I just rendered it closed, just so you get that nice little cool pyramid type shape right there on the front. Obviously, from this point here, this thing is ready for its preliminary paint, and it will be going to that momentarily. Then this takes us to the carriage, and the carriage is also, again, very nicely rendered, and the parts are very small, but are very nicely detailed. Again, this is something that's not going to be for the faint of heart, and if you don't have the type of skill sets required for this, it's going to be going messy really quick, really fast. So, one thing I do want to mention is that on this piece over here, there is a small error with the instructions, where, note, we have these three components. You have this bar... That, that runs along the entire side. We have this other little crank wheel set up, and then there's this little peg that emerges out. Well, if you follow the instructions, the little crank wheel mount is depicted in the wrong location. And if you're trying to install it, it's not going to fit. And if you're you know, trying to install in that format, it's not going to fit. You may get a little frustrated and try to twerk or modify something in order to make it fit in place in that area. But if you do, you're going to ruin it. The piece does not get mounted in that location. Instead, it gets mounted in the holes right above it because the hole in the bottom is for this angled stem that you see here. I'll go ahead and grab the instructions and show you exactly what I'm referring to. And that would be this right over here. As you can see, the arrow clearly points to the hole on the bottom, and this arrow points to that little bracket right over there. If you try to fit it in place, it's just not going to fit. So when you're installing this component, be sure to not install in this hole, but into that hole. If you do, it'll just line up as it was originally designed. This hole here is going to be for this bit of equipment that they have on the next image. And oddly enough, this here is rendered in the correct manner. So this is something you need to pay attention to during your build. Another thing I want to mention is with these little bits over here that are supposedly going to be fully functional. A lot of artillery piece kits like this tend to have this type of a feature. Generally, more often than not, they are so frail and tiny that they don't really end up working too well in practice. But if you take your time, in some occasions, I have been able to get them to operate. But again, it's one of those things you really don't want to mess with all that often. Specifically, once paint and everything goes on these surfaces over here, tolerances tighten up, and it just doesn't become that viable in my opinion. But I'm, that's not going to stop me from at least giving it the old college try. Starting with the model suspension, here you can see what the model looks like tilted on its side, so you really get a good idea on the detail components in better light. The suspension on this kit here is definitely one of its strong suits, no question about it. The suspension is very, very intricately molded, which means it has some excellent detail fidelity. Every linkage, pivot point, turn knuckle, Every little bit of detailing that you would imagine on the real one is present and is rendered on the Dragon counterpart. Of course, this detail fidelity comes at a cost with terms of added complexity and also with added fragility, but it's definitely worth the squeeze, specifically if you have the patience and the tooling required in order to get the parts properly deburred and fitted in their appropriate locations. One thing about the suspension components is that there isn't really any hand fiddling required. The parts go on in their appropriate locations and everything basically is a perfect fit. So the kit is very excellently engineered in that regard. 
I'm not sure if this is really going to come out all that well with the lighting situation that I have here. However, one little bit of detailing that is found on all of these armor car models, and it's one that people generally forget or don't think about during the paintwork, is with the rubber boot that we have right here that is found where the drive shaft emerges from the lower hull. The rubber boot is very nicely rendered on this kit here, but the one thing that generally people forget to do is to paint them. On this model here, all of these sections here are painted with a little swipe of Tamiya rubber black. Uh, wait, oh, I got a flashlight here, so hopefully this comes out in better light. Ah, perfect. Okay, so you can see here that the black paint was added to all of these locations over here, and you can really see just how much more detail it gives the model without doing all that much more extra work. A lot of times on these models it's all with the painting. The models do have lots of details integrally molded on, it's just a lot of people just don't know or just forget to paint the pieces with a different color and if they do that the build definitely improves in its quality compared to just leaving everything, well, overpainted, like I frequently mention. Before I depart from the suspension, one thing that I do want to mention, because I'm pretty sure someone out there is going to ask this in the comments section, is that does this kit have the ability to have the wheels rendered with the wheels in their turned configuration? And the answer is no. The model is designed from the get-go to have the wheels in the straight line configuration that you see here on my build. In order for someone to render this build with the wheels in the pivoted manner, you are going to have to work outside the confines of the kit and do some heavy modifications to the turn knuckles as well as the turning system that are present on all these locations. It's not something that can just be easily done and it is going to take quite a bit of extra scratch building on the builder's behalf in order to execute that type of a format. However, if this is something that you deem necessary, perhaps this is something that you want to really evaluate on the viability because in my opinion, it's definitely going to be a lot of extra scratch building in order to achieve that effect. Same is also true with the swing arm locations. If you're trying to render them with the model being placed on uneven terrain, this too is going to require a lot of scratch building in order to have the suspension configured in that format. From the suspension brings it to the tires and the tires on this model here are excellent. They are very well engineered in that they are a multi-piece assembly. However, they go together without any sort of problems. One other thing I want to mention is that with the way the tires are designed, they are a two-piece assembly and generally this is something that you're going to have to contend with with a seam line where the two sections meet. However, with this model over here, that's just not the case. Because of the way the real tires are rendered on the real vehicle, the seam line is naturally present, so the way you see it on this model here is exactly how it would look like on the actual example, which is a perfect way to camouflage and conceal seam work, since trying to do body work on this type of setup over here is a bit problematic. The other thing I want to mention is with the design of the hubs themselves. The rims that are found on the model here are an option and there's two patterns of rims that are supplied with this model. This is great because it allows you to have the model in one or two different configurations. If you're also clever enough and you want to so choose to do so, you can have the model with a mix and match of row wheels, which is potentially a way to add a little bit of extra character to your build, and perhaps this might be something to consider for someone that's looking to have their model be a little bit more spicier compared to just like the build I've done here where all of the wheels are in the same format. Moving up takes it to the tin work, and there's nothing to mention over here. The tin work was excellently engineered by Dragon. All the appropriate components went on as intended, and the assembly went on without any sort of hiccups. The one thing that I do want to mention though is again with the format on how you assemble all these components. Because of the detail that's found on the suspension sections, I strongly recommend pre-priming and painting the lower extremities of the hull as well as the undersides of the tin work prior to the installation. Once these components get fitted in place, trying to get access into these areas with the paint is going to be a bit problematic. So by pre-priming them prior to the sections being installed. This is a great way to ensure that all sections have a coat of primer on them, so this will definitely simplify the paint work that gets to be added to the model towards the tail end of the build. On a similar note, this leads us to the upper and lower hull sections. The assemblies on both of these locations over here are again excellent. Only very minimum seam removal work was required on the locations where the upper and lower hull sections meet. In order to do this, just some drops of super glue were utilized and then 
some drops of fine super glue were used in order to act as gap filler. No red putty was required and these seams were very minimal and once addressed it just blended in for a nice seamless appearance that you see here. Shifting our way to the front section of the build, you can see the bumper as well as all the other front detail components. All of the components you see here are stock out of the box as well as the remainder of the build, but these were the plastic units that were utilized. The kit does have the option to swap out some of the guards with the photo etch counterparts. However, in my opinion, the PE ones weren't really necessary because the plastic ones were just so finely molded that I just simply used them in place. But this is definitely something that is up to the builder's discretion. If you want to use the PE ones, you definitely have the ability to do so if theme fit. But having said that, the plastic ones are again more than suffice for the job at hand. Of course, the one exception to utilizing the kit parts was with the indicators. I honestly couldn't resist myself. Those kit ones are very nicely rendered. I'm talking about the plastic ones. However, those brass CNC included ones, you would have to be a fool not to use them. They are just excellent. They are literally gorgeous. Uh, one other thing I want to mention about them is that Dragon even anticipated how to bend them because the pieces of course are straight and on these German armor cars they have a distinctive bend to them in the configuration that you see here. Well, supplied with the Dragon Kit on one of the runners, there's a small little jig that's integrally molded on and it's at the perfect angle where it shows you how to line the piece up and make the bend to the appropriate location also to the appropriate angle. The jig works like a charm. Once the bend is made in the right location with a small plier, the pieces are then dropped directly onto the build. There's absolutely no other modifications need to be made to the model. The parts are a direct drop-in installation from the standard plastic ones. Again, one of the hallmarks found on this kit, and it is just an excellent bit of detail once fitted. As for the paintwork, you'll see that the top portions where the balls are are painted in white. This is something that is seen on many other German armor cars, not just the Achtungladen family. Also on this location here, I want to mention the quality of the Bosch light, which is a multi-part assembly, which again leads for much greater detail fidelity. The siren is another piece that is exquisitely rendered, and everything just went on without any sort of issues. Moving our way to the rear takes us to the spare tire. Again, everything went on without any sort of problems. The rear blackout light, which again, one thing that I always mention in these videos, is to properly paint these with the correct paintwork. The, the rear light is actually a little hinge type fitting and on the bottom there are these two half round lenses while the other ones are these little squares. The half round ones are yellow and red while the squares are always with a green coloring. The model does have the ability to have this section flipped so if you want to have it with the blackout sections covered up. This is definitely something that can be done, but for this model here, I went with the small little square sections that you see. For the paint, I actually use just Tester's enamel green paint, and it is the perfect color to use for these German tanks for this type of fitting, and it's one that I've touched upon in a number of other videos. One other thing about the blackout light to mention is that that little hinge section is an optional piece, and you have the same piece rendered in plastic as well as in photo etch. So, Whichever one you deem fit, you can use on this build. If I'm not mistaken, I think I kept the plastic one. It was just so nicely rendered, I didn't really see the need to replace it with the PE counterpart. Moving upward takes to the rear exhaust manifold, and this was something that I actually ran into a small little hiccup during the build. With the way the piece is designed, it is again a multi-part assembly, and it's about three or four pieces that get assembled in order to give you the geometry that we have here. The pieces go together very, very well. However, one thing you need to consider is with the outlet that we have right here. With the way the part is designed, this needs to be installed before an end cap is secured in place. And when you're working on the build, you may be going through the motions and not think about adding this component on at that point. If you do, you're going to have to do a little bit more work compared to just building it out of the box. Basically, there is a small little shelf that's molded into the bottom portion of this little elbow over here, and this locks into the appropriate location in the exhaust manifold. If you were like me and you just glued the outer section on first before the elbow, you just simply snip off that little shelf with the clean cut snip, and then just glue on the elbow in the configuration that we have here. 
very easily done, but it's something to pay attention to. The other thing to mention is that there is a seam to contend with where the two sections meet. Again, pretty easily taken care of and addressed. Only thing I used was some thick super glue and a little bit of sandpaper. I was able to polish it away. It's actually because of that why I did include the little elbow on at that time because I figured it was easier to just polish everything away without that little elbow in place. But by doing that, you now have to worry about that little shelf that I just referenced. If I was to do the build again, I think I'd still do it the same way to be honest. Just removing the seam work without that little elbow in the way is just so much more advantageous compared to trying to work around it with the sandpaper. It'd still be done, but I don't know. It's one of those things I really don't think I would change if I was to do it over again. Moving upward takes to the rear engine deck, and this is definitely one of the highlights found on the kit. The louver detailing and the execution is exquisitely done by Dragon with the out-of-the-box configuration. There is an aftermarket hop-up that I believe swaps these out for PE, but seriously, I just don't think that's really necessary. The kit ones are wonderful. Once they are assembled, they have the look that you can see here, which leads for some very realistic effects. The other thing to mention is that the kit does give an option to have the louvers rendered in the open or closed state. Obviously, this was a no-brainer. I'm going to roll with them in the open condition because they just look so much better. But if you choose to render it in the closed configuration for one reason or another, this is, again, an option that's available to the builder. Carry on takes it to the side tin work detailing, and again, the kit doesn't disappoint. Starting with the jerry cans, these are probably some of the best German jerry cans I've ever worked on on any plastic model kit. They are a multi-part assembly, which is quite standard on a lot of kits out there. However, with this one here, they are even that much more gr nicer because of that center spine that is a typical feature and is a distinctive feature found on the German jerry cans. There's a YouTuber out there that has a whole history about the German jerry can and how this was done, but it's actually one of the more important bits of engineering that the kit piece does have. As for the model over here, the way this was rendered out was very clever. The middle section is actually a piece of photo etch, and it's sandwiched in between the two plastic sections. This gives you the most realistic looking jerry can that I've ever seen in 135. They are just gorgeous. They build very well, they assemble perfectly, and they mount onto the, the mounts even more problem free. The kit supplies you, for some more good news, a lot of them. So you have several that you have in your spare bin that will definitely come in handy in case you're working on any other type of German AFE. It's not just true for the jerry cans, but even the jerry can mounts themselves, which is a nice bit of equipment to keep in your spare parts bin. The mounts themselves are, again, a multi-part assembly. We have the bracket as well as the straps. The straps are very nicely rendered for the medium that they are in. They are just standard plastic. They're not photo watch or anything like that. And the buckles are nicely rendered. The only thing you gotta do as a builder is again to properly paint everything. The belts are leather and the little belt sections are just painted with a little bit of flat black. If you use a very careful fine point paintbrush, you can easily achieve the same effects that I've done here. And once done, it leaves for just that much more extra accuracy. Same is also true for the jack. The jack here is probably one of the best German World War II jacks that I've seen on any 135th scale model kit. Dragon has rinse, washed, and repeated this set here on many other builds for, again, really good reason because their jacks are exquisitely rendered. That is true for not just the jack detailing itself, but also the jack mounts, which are all separate pieces, and once they get assembled, these are some very realistic effects. Furthermore, on this side, you can also see the cleaning staves. These are the wooden rods that are used to swab the main pack 40 when you're doing maintenance on it. And again, this is another thing where a lot of builders out there either don't know what it is or they miss paint the parts or not paint them at all. And again, all of these are hurting the look of the build. On German vehicles, the poles themselves are made out of wooden rods. And the end connectors, which is generally the bit of detailing most people tend to forget about, are made from brass. So when you're painting these sections over here, paint the middle sections with wood, the end connectors with a little swipe of gold paint, and presto, you will have the cleaning staves painted in the appropriate configuration. Of course, the remainder of the tools would include the fire extinguisher, as I typically do. I usually paint it a different color on the model, just to give the model a little bit of extra character. And you can also see the main shovels found here on the front, kit supplied, and are just absolutely excellent out of the box. On the flip side, same is true for the equipment found on the other end, which is another one of those fire extinguishers, the wire cutter, as well as the 
axe and pickaxe. Again, all components you see are mounted out of the box and they went out without any sort of issues. Hopping back to this side here brings us to the antenna and the antenna base. Now for this one here, I actually did something that I generally don't normally do on my builds, and that was to keep the plastic molded antenna. Like I've touched upon before, the plastic antennas are always a bit problematic because they tend to be a little bit chunky with their molding just because of just the nature of antennas, but also more importantly, they have a bad habit on breaking, and if they do, they are impossible to repair. And generally on my builds, I either just snip them from the get-go, and I replace them with a piece of wire. But for this one here, I decided why not, let me try rolling the dice. So, as you can see in the current configuration, it has the original antenna. I don't believe the antenna on this one's gonna cause too much of a problem, specifically after I'm filming. It goes into its nice hermetically sealed plastic box where it will definitely be spared from any sort of potential issues of getting bumped into. But this is something that always is a concern whenever you work with plastic models like this. As for the antenna base itself, of course I painted in my usual format where the bottom portion is painted to replicate rubber, which is of course seen on German AFVs, and the little butterfly tie down point here is painted in brass. Again, this is what is typically seen on German World War II military vehicles. Moving upward takes to the fighting compartment. There's nothing really too much to add since I already went over this information in more depth earlier on in the video, but now that the model is fully completed, you can see what the interior looks like once everything is fleshed out. One thing that I do want to mention that is something that caught my eye about this build here is something that indicates to me that this vehicle's design was more or less shoehorned in as opposed to something that was well thought out. And that is with the loader section here. Obviously, you know, you need to have a loader in this area in order to load the Pack 40 in order to fire it. But this area here is not really well conducive for this secondary driver. And I can't imagine the loader being too comfortable with trying to work in the confines here while having a steering wheel stick shifts and all the other amenities required to drive the vehicle from the rear section in this area. It's not really a well thought out fighting compartment to be honest. And uh, I could see several twisted ankles occurring when trying to use this thing in combat. But you know, perhaps the unit can fold up or pivot out of the way. If anyone knows that, feel free to mention that in the comment section listed below because in this configuration here, yeah, it really doesn't look that comfortable at all. Carry on takes to the MG42, and this again is the kit supply piece, and the kit one is excellent. The detailing is nice and crisp. All the details that would be found on the real unit are found on the model one, and it's just a gorgeous piece to use out of the box. The paintwork is quite typical for my builds where the receiver sections are painted in black, the dry brushing is added to get the distressed look that you see here, and of course, like I generally mentioned, the buttstock and the pistol grip are painted to resemble red Bakelite, which is a very common material used on the MG42. There are other options out there. You can try to replicate wood, but realistically, the MG42s mostly had Bakelite furniture, and the Bakelite came in different shades of brown, but also black. So this is also something to consider if you're working on any sort of World War II German military vehicle. On the grips themselves, only the panels are painted with the red Bakelite, so you want to keep this in mind. The spine section is metal and it's only the two grip panels on either side that would be made from the plastic and again this is something to consider because a lot of people they just go in there with a paintbrush haphazardly and paint the whole thing in red or black and that's not really helping your cows. On the front portion of the MG42 I could see that the hole for the muzzle was drilled out. I'm not sure if this came this way on this one or if this was something that I added myself but I'm pretty sure this is something that I added with the pin vise. This is generally done with a pin vise with a really small bit and like I always mention if you do not have a pin vise, the bit or the technique on hand, you might want to set this one out because you can easily screw up the muzzle section if that happens. Again, you're not doing yourself any favors. At the very front portion of the model takes to the travel lock. The travel lock you see here is kit supplied and one really cool feature that the kit has is that if you're careful you can actually make the piece fully functional as I've done right here. As you can see the piece can pivot out of the way and on the real one this is how you would take the Pack 40 out of its travel mode and have the ability to actually use it. In order to make the piece function, all you gotta do is just carefully glue the mounts to the model and not add any glue to the hinge section. Once the 
unit fully dries, you will have this section in the fully operating format like you see on my build. One thing I like about the travel lock, specifically on this build, is that it actually does a pretty good job with supporting the barrel. With the way the aluminum barrel is found on this model, the front tends to be a bit on the he front heavy end, and after the model is moved or shaken a little bit, the barrel tends to want to droop. And if you have the travel lock here, it tends to keep it up. However, having said that, the barrel obviously still stays up on its own without real any problems. But I just like to have the extra support of the component like you see right here. And while on the topic of the Pack 40, I do want to mention that the unit is a complete static piece. And what I mean by that is you cannot pivot it left and right or even up and down for that matter. The recoil, technically something that can be actuated as well as the breech can uh, be opened. I don't glue my breeches in place, it's just held on there with friction. However, with the fragility and frailness of the model, it's really not something that I recommend. It's one of those things, again, like with the suspension, where if you want to display the model in that format, you just build it in that set up from the get-go, and you can basically call it a day. Although, unlike the suspension sets, which will require heavy scratch building and modification in order to achieve that type of effect, for the Pack 40 here, that's just not the case. You simply just align it in the configuration that you want it, and basically call it a day at that point. And that's really all there is to mention about the details, and this leads us to the paint and the markings. For the model's camouflage pattern, I went with a dual-tone camouflage scheme, and this is the other option that was mentioned on the box, as well as also in the instruction sheet. For this one here, instead of it being a yellow dominant pattern, this is actually a brown dominant pattern. And what I mean by that is that when I'm painting the model, instead of painting the entire model with its base coat of Dunkel Gelb, I actually start with Dunkel Brown. It's not really that visible from the top side, but if you look at the bottom portion of the model, you will see what I'm referring to. All of the model is painted with a majority of the Dunkel Brown, and that's the color that you can see here. The Dunkel Gelb was then just airbrushed with the camouflage pattern configuration that you see presently. After the camouflage pattern was applied, I went ahead and weathered it in my usual type of format, which would include washes, filters, and then some dry brushing to add the chipping effects that are present on the model. Of course, shading was done as well, and that was done with the airbrush. For the actual decals, the kit supply ones were utilized, and they are excellent. Dragon just has some excellent water slide decals, and this one here was no exception. The decal options are actually quite expansive for this kit, and one thing that I want to mention is with the bumper ID numbers. The kit does supply you with the type of markings where it gives you a white blank license plate, and then you have to manually put in all of the little letters and numbers that you would see here on the front and rear. And I have done this on a few builds in the past, and Oh boy, is it tedious to say the least. It's pretty cool because you get to customize it to any way you want, but it's also a bit tedious and will require extra work in terms of separate layers of varnish in order to make sure that everything stays put when you're maneuvering the leading and the kerning on all the letters. For this one here, those decals again are supplied, but fortunately for me doing the big brain move and going with this version of the vehicle, it had the decals already numbered out, ready to go as one unit, so I didn't have to play any typesetter with the actual numbers. The decals just went on without any problems. Once everything was dry, I simply covered the entire model here with VMS matte varnish, as I often mention. The VMS is a fantastic varnish out there for 135th scale models. It does a great job with sealing them for, to the surface, gets rid of any sort of silvering, and as you can see, it just makes the model look all that much more polished. Can't recommend that product enough, and I use it basically on every single small-scale build that I've mentioned on this channel for the last couple of years. In addition to the usage of the varnish, the decals that are supplied with these Dragon kits work even better with said varnish, and as you can see, the two are just a match made in heaven. In the end, I literally could not be any happier in how this build turned out. This one far exceeded my expectations, and the model with both the interior, exterior, paintwork, and detail work just came out to be nearly perfect. This was basically a close to perfection build as I can possibly think of. Outside of the sheer enjoyment that I received from working on this model over here, the idea that this was one of those stale stash inhabitants that was sitting for far too long unassembled in the stash, and now that it's finally been 
built and sitting in the collection is definitely a rewarding experience and feeling that I definitely have. However, although this model was sitting in the stash for a long duration of time, it was definitely in my opinion for the best. Because in the years between the acquisition of this kit and this model being built over here, my skill levels have definitely matured to the point where if I would have built this model all those years ago, it would not have been nearly as good as the way it came out in this video over here. So this is definitely one of those things where it's a good thing that I got to it later than sooner. And that is literally the most perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendations. So right out of the bat, if you are someone who is a casual builder, you know, the type of person that doesn't really build models all that often, maybe you have, you know, four or five, maybe one or two in your collection, and you're looking to just add this type of vehicle for one reason or another. On a similar note, if you're a beginner and you're someone who, again, only has like a number of models or haven't built any models before, but you really dig this vehicle over here, then this is absolutely, most certainly, positively, not going to be the kit for you. I cannot stress that enough. If you do not have the skill sets required to put this model together, do not walk, run in the opposite direction from the following kit. Trust me, I am definitely doing you a favor and I'm saving you a whole heap and load of headache and frustration because this model here is not a simple kit at all to put together. Yes, Dragon did a very good job with designing the kit and engineering the kit's components to fit as well as they do. And the kit itself, by the most part, is an excellent model kit. However, because of the subject matter and just with the way the nature of this particular vehicle is, this does not lend itself to simplicity. It is extremely complex and because of that you will have very finely molded detail parts that are very fiddly and are very easily broken and also easily lost. So you are going to have to have your ducks in a row when you tackle a model like this. And the people that I just referenced earlier are definitely not the type of individuals that are ready to step up to the plate for a model of this type of complexity and this type of detailing straight out of the bat. Normally at this time of the video I would say, well, you know, the kit's not really intended for a beginner, but if you're an intermediate to an advanced range person, you could probably tackle one of these builds with no problems. And if that's you and you're nodding your head right now, well, you might want to pump your brakes because I still really wouldn't recommend this kit for someone even with an intermediate skill set. The reason why I say that is again due to the sheer complexity on this model over here. An intermediate should have theoretically the skill sets and the tools in order to potentially build one of these kits. However, they are still going to be challenged a little bit in getting the model fully assembled. That is literally how complex and fiddly this kit really is. This kit here is more or less intended for an advanced individual. If you are the type of person that has all of your skill sets in a row from painting to working on small fiddly bits to photo etch to clear plastic, where you have the ability to really manage out the sequence of assembly, if you have all of these skill sets in a row, then that would be the type of person who I'd recommend this kit to all day long. The intermediate, again, can potentially assemble one of these models here, but it's definitely going to be something that you're going to be stretching your legs a little bit in order to put together. As for the advanced builder, well, there's nothing really much more to say outside of what I mentioned before. This is going to be the kit for you. The kit is exquisitely detailed, both interior, exterior, suspension, all of that good stuff. And it just beckons for someone with the proper skill sets to go ahead and assemble it. And if you do have those sets, this kit here will be a fantastic time for you. Outside of the kit's configuration, there are lots of other detail accessories out there for this pattern of vehicle in order to improve it further from what the kit already gives you. These would be things like cast resin components, CNC components, photo etch pieces, and these days even 3D print. However, for this particular build here, it's not really that necessary in my opinion. The reason why I say that is because with the quality levels of this kit, the molded detail parts are excellent. And in addition to that, this kit out of the box also supplies you with many of those features that are generally considered to be aftermarket components. But for this one here, they just come with the build. These would be things like the CNC barrel, as well as the brass CNC fender indicators, and even, yes, the photo etch that are supplied with this model over here, which for this one here are completely stock. Normally, these would be needed as an aftermarket accessory. 
But for this one here, that's not necessary, and the kit just gives them to you, just standard, like any other component that's supplied with this kit. I'm pretty sure that there are some other accessories out there that some individuals will definitely might want to look into for one reason or another. But if you're just looking to build the model in its base configuration, really the stock out-of-the-box components will do the job perfectly well. However, just like with the case with everything in the aftermarket part realm, this is always up to the discretion of the builder at hand. Before I move on from the skill sets, I do want to circle back to what I mentioned before with the other individuals who I really wouldn't recommend this kit to. If you're the type of person that really loves this vehicle pattern for one reason or another, but do not have the skill sets in order to build this particular version, there is another competitive option on the market. The other version is from Italeri. That model is the exact same pattern of vehicles, this one over here. However, the tooling on that model is much more simplistic and simplified compared to the example here on the Dragon. This is great if you are, again, a casual builder and you want to have this vehicle type in your collection, but don't want to go through the rigmaroles of building this one over here. Or if you're an intermediate builder and you want to get this one, but want something to, you know, prime the pump, so to speak, you know, build as a dry run, the Italeri one would definitely be something to consider. And in case anyone is wondering, yes, I would have absolutely no problems with adding the Italeri unit to my collection as well. But then again, I love building tank models and, you know, I just love collecting and building everything that's out there. So with that aside, this leads us to recommendations. So first and foremost, this is a no-brainer. I would recommend this kit for anyone who's a fan of World War II German armor. Outside of World War II German armor, if you're a fan of just World War II German armor, armor cars or just armor cars in general, this kit here is highly recommended. This model here, because of the configuration it's in, I would also recommend it for anyone who's into building dioramas. Because of the open top nature of this vehicle, you do have lots of really excellent interior detailing that's showcased on the inside. And because of that, this would make it an excellent candidate for use in a diorama scene. You could have it in either some kind of a fighting type scene or an ambush type format, or, you know, a bunch of other things could easily come to mind. Also, with the way Dragon designed the remainder of the kit, this opens up possibilities to having the model with the fenders removed or with some of the suspension being worked on or partially damaged. Again, this definitely opens up the imagination because of what the kit brings to the table. The last person who I'd recommend this kit to is the type of person that I haven't really mentioned too much in these videos, but I've encountered several of them in my emails as well as also in the comment section on a number of my other videos. And these are individuals who are looking for a build that is either going to be challenging as well as a build that's going to take a little bit of time to execute. These are the type of people that they want to buy a model kit, but they want it to be the type of build that they can sit down slowly, methodically work on and not have it just get built up in a matter of a number of hours. These are the type of people that they want a good bang from their buck, so to speak, and if that's you, then this is going to be the kit for you. Because of the way Dragon executed this model over here, this is going to be the type of build that you're going to want to pace yourself, you're going to pump your brakes, and you're going to go through the motions of the build, and it's going to take a little bit more time to assemble compared to several other kits that I've done reviews on in the past. However, this does come with the asterisk that you are a person with an advanced or even a really high-end intermediate skill set. Because if you do not have your skill sets lined up, it doesn't matter how methodical or how slow you are with the build. If you don't know how to clean components or work with small fiddly bits, not to mention paint everything, it doesn't really do yourself any favors. But if you are the type of person that has everything that I mentioned before, and you're looking for a nice, slow, methodical build, yeah, I cannot recommend this kit enough to add to your collection. Absolutely. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale German World War II STKFC 234-4 armor car. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posts of content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.